You get a Nokia uh, DCT4 phone, I believe. Um, the 3310 does the, the, the two European bands, the 3390 does uh, at least one of the, the US bands. Um, what these do is they support a thing called network monitor mode. And what network monitor does is it effectively dumps a log of every GSM thing that the cell phone does. Every packet that it sends to the base station, every, every burst that it receives from the base station, everything. Every single thing that that cell phone does gets logged. Doesn't allow you to interact with it, doesn't allow you to control it, other than you know, beyond what you can do on the, the handset already, but it does at least give you very, very detailed insight into what your phone sees on the, 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 the GSM network. So you get one of these phones, um, you get near a, a special FBUS, MBUS switching cable um, and a program called GAMU. Um, there's a, a GAMU is, is open source, it, it connects to the, the, the phone over this cable um, and just dumps out a trace in, in XML, which you can open up in Wireshark. Um, I, I was going to demo it, but uh, my, my 3390 has, has gone wandering. So what I'm going to do instead is just show you what the traffic looks like. So this is a, a capture that I recorded last night. Um, this was of a, a handset connecting to T-Mobile. And um, I actually caught it only part way through the boot sequence. So there's, there's a, a bunch of traffic that was you know, hanging off the top here. But you can see you've got all of the, the, the various GSM messages in here. Um, and if I click on the right packet, uh, let's try system information type two, which is that one. Um, you can see Wireshark breaks it down nicely. And within this packet, it actually says, here's my list of neighbors. So literally, you, you just take this phone, you turn it on, you connect the cable, you run GAMU, and then you look at the Wireshark trace and you've got a list of channels. You then compare that, you know, just literally turn a radio receiver onto each of those channels and see if you get a signal on them. It's, it's not hard. And, and using this, you can find a, an advertised neighbor um, that's not actually in use in the local area and, and speed off handoffs by uh, taking advantage of that. Now, I'm not actually going to demonstrate that today uh, because that would require me to, to you know, transmit on a, uh, an AT&T frequency, and I, I, I don't want to do that. Um, certainly, an attacker would have no such compulsion and, and could easily take advantage of this uh, to his benefit. So we can find GSM neighbors, and we can take advantage of that. Another way to speed up handoffs is the location area code. Um, the idea of the, the LAC is it groups together a bunch of cells. So you'll have you know, a whole bunch of cells in, in one specific area that advertise the same LAC. And in general, those will go to you know, the same higher level controllers as well. Um, but what happens is when the phone is you know, monitoring all of these neighbors and you know, if it just sees another tower or, or whatever reason it is to, to, to look at that secondary tower that it's seen, um, it'll see that if that tower is, is advertising a different location area code, that means that the cell phone has moved, at least as far as the cell phone is concerned. And if the cell phone's moved and it's moved into a new area, then it should really do a handoff. So from OpenBTS here, I have complete control over the LAC. So I can just change the LAC and everyone's phone will go, oh, hey, LAC's changed. We must have driven 50 miles down the road. Let's hand off to the new tower. So the more you change the lack, you can, you can keep rolling the lack every, every few minutes just to entice more handsets. Um, it's, it's not particularly difficult to do. Um, I'll give you a quick demo of it. Um, first up, let's, uh, let's see how many handsets. So before we, we started spoofing uh, AT&T, um, we had about 30 handsets connected. Um, now that I've got uh, AT&T's network name, MNC and MCC, um, let's see how many handsets we have connected now. 24. Don't quite know how that went down. Um, Timsy's do timeout. So another command that uh, I can try is load. And this is telling me, oh, this is telling me that there's 24 Timsy's in use as well. So 
Um, not too sure what's going on there, but we've certainly got a, a, a bunch of handsets connected. And then we can use the cell ID command again to, to roll the location area code. I'm just going to turn this around a second so I can actually see. So my location area code was 666. I guess I should change that to 31337. Um, and I keep the cell ID at 10. In fact, I'll change the cell ID as well just so that the, uh, the handsets know it's a, a new tower. And it's that hard. That's how to roll the LAC. Um, not a complex operation at all. And then, like I say, that'll encourage handsets to, to you know, believe that they've changed location, and that should entice more handsets to, to camp across to the new network. We'll, we'll come back to that when, uh, when, we, when we do the next stage and we'll see how successful that was. So, what happens when the handset turns on? How does the, the, the handset first find its very first tower? Um, when it, obviously, when it boots up, it knows nothing. It, knows, it doesn't know where it is. It doesn't know what frequency it's on. Um, doesn't have any neighbors to look for. Doesn't know the current LAC. Nothing like that. So it does a very, very long scan over the entire band. And whatever towers it finds, um, the, uh, the, it checks the MNC and the MCC, tries to make sure that you know, those are allowed networks based on you know, what the SIM card will actually connect to, and then the signal strength as well. And it'll just you know, connect to the strongest tower. Once it starts finding some towers, it, it limits the size of that scan. It performs a much smaller scan much more rapidly because it has some information about you know, what bands are in use, what towers are in use, what channels to look for, all this kind of stuff. So an attacker can actually use this to, to his advantage because if you DOS the cell phone system um, in order to, to you know, make people lose signal, when those handsets connect back up again, um, they're going to perform this long scan. They're going to perform this, this much wider band scan um, and have a much higher chance of, of connecting to the attacker's tower. So how can we do this? Well, first off, we're only talking about second generation GSM, 2G. 3G has much better security, much, much, much better security. So if we jam the GSM band, then when we turn the jammer off, um, your handset's going to perform a wider search. It's going to perform a, a, a bit slightly slower search, a bit more um, chance of finding the tower. However, if you're on 3G, um, there's really nothing I can do. The, the 3G protocols are much, much stronger than GSM, and uh, it's a lot harder to intercept a 3G phone call. So we really don't want people using 3G if, if we're trying to intercept phone calls. So what we have to do is, is jam the 3G bands. If we jam the 3G band, um, your phones lose the ability to connect to a 3G tower, and they quite happily drop down to 2G. So all you have to do, literally, is broadcast noise and block the ability to talk to 3G, at which point everyone drops down to, to 2G in plain text. It's like saying, well, if you, if you can't connect to port 22, then yeah, that just fail over to port 23. Um, seriously, you can, you can think of 3G as, as you know, equivalent to SSH and, and GSM as equivalent to Telnet in this situation. So yeah, it, it would be an accurate analogy to say that you know, if you can't connect to the SSH port, just drop down to Telnet. Um, that's effectively how, how cell phones work in this situation. So the question is, how hard is it to jam a cellular band? Really not very. Um, all you need to do, really, is transmit noise. And when, I'm, when I say noise, I mean a very specific thing. Um, I don't just mean you know, randomness. I mean completely flat um, spectral noise, such that there is you know, equal amounts of power in each octave, and you know, it's, it's a nice flat spectrum, and it, it makes sure to cover the entire band, cover every channel. Um, effectively, what we're doing is, is instead of you know, removing the tower completely, we're just removing the ability to see the tower. We're, we're masking that with, with noise. Um, noise generators really aren't very expensive. Um, I have one over here. Um, little, little thing. Uh, if I can do this without squishing my ninja badge. Say again? No, it's all good. 
So this is a, this is a noise generator. Um, this was $450 on eBay. And if I connect this to a power amplifier, and I have a power amplifier upstairs, and then connect the power amplifier into an antenna, and I have antennas, clearly, if I turn that on, um, that's rather a large disruption to cell phone service. Um, I can, I can, I mean, the, the, the noise generator itself was, as I say, uh, as it says, 450 bucks on eBay. The power amp was 400 bucks on eBay. Uh, not, not on eBay, uh, on the internet at least. Uh, that's 100 watts. 100 watts of wideband noise is a huge, huge, huge disruption. This is what it looks like. Um, the, this particular noise generator has two modes. Um, it has one for the, the 900 megahertz bands and one for the 1900 megahertz bands. So what you're looking at here is uh, the, the trace from a spectrum analyzer. Um, the lowest frequency on the left is about f uh, at 500 megahertz. And the highest frequency on the right is 2.5 gigahertz. And then as the line goes up, there's, there's obviously more power at whatever frequency that corresponds to. So you can see on the left, we've got a really big, fat block around 900 megahertz. That, that is effectively this thing transmitting on every possible frequency in every possible you know, channel between about 850 and 950 megahertz. Turn that thing on and, and yeah, 850 and 950 just stops working. Likewise, in 1900 mode, um, you can see again the, the, the major peak is a little further over. Um, it's, it's pretty clear that this does what we need it to do. So what happens when you jam a cellular band? What happens when you know, I turn this thing on and, and you know, broadcast 100 watts of noise? Of course I haven't done it. I'm not stupid. Um, if you were to do this, if I was to plug this thing into my 100 watt power amplifier and I was to connect it to an antenna and turn the whole thing on, um, it would probably knock out GSM, CDMA, 3G, Verizon, you know, pretty much every cell phone service there is for most of Las Vegas. <laughs> if not further. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm not turning this thing on. Um, the main reason that I have this is because it's a fabulously useful piece of test equipment. Um, if you're trying to classify filters, um, you put wideband noise into a filter, and as long as it's nice and smooth, you can compare what comes out and, and very, very accurately characterize your filter. Um, that's what I use this for, not for, for, for DOS. Um, the thing about band jamming is that there is no way to defend. It's impossible, cannot be done. Um, short of swamping it with, with more and more power. Um, you do only need a short burst, a few seconds, but it's still way, way, way too offensive for, for what I'm doing here. Um, so as I said, 100 watt of amplifier and a, a reasonable antenna would probably knock out Las Vegas cell phone systems. So another technique that we can use um, to, to make handsets uh, hand over, um, there's a, a command that the BTS can send the handset that basically says, treat my signal as if it was stronger than it actually is. Meaning that if, if I just, let's, let's say, you know, on a, on a scale of, you know, plus 50 to minus 100, let's, let's um, anyone who knows RF will, will understand why I'm, I'm choosing that range. Um, but plus 50 to minus 100, um, let's say my signal is coming in at minus 80, really, really low. Um, I can say to your handsets, just, just add 100 to that, would you? And they'll go, oh, okay, you've got a you know, 20 dBm signal. Ah, that's fine, you're the strongest tower around now. I'll connect to you. It's, it's ridiculous, and it's, it's, again, it's another great example of some of the instructions that a BTS can send a handset. Um, so, you know, I don't even necessarily need to be the strongest signal. I just need to have a signal that you can pick up and be telling you that I'm the strongest signal. It's, it's ridiculous. And, and the handset will comply. It has to comply because that's how GSM works. When the handset gets an instruction from the tower, it complies with it. Um, the, 
of course the attacker can make use of this. Um, you know, of course it, it means that he has to use less RF power to, to, to win the strength competition with the local towers. Um, OpenBTS doesn't actually support it yet, um, so I, I, I won't demonstrate it here. Um, this is actually the, the essence of the Roden Schwartz patents uh, on MZ catchers. There was a, a case in the UK where someone was selling 